People come to cities for a whole variety of reasons, from positive choice to imposed necessity. The element of movement and migration within and between is an important aspect of today's city. But cities are also settlements and a continuing question necessarily has to concern how such differences are to live together. Hello and welcome to Spatial Delight, a podcast about space, society and power, inspired by geographer Doreen Massey. I'm your host, Agata Lisiak, Associate Professor of Migration Studies at Bard College Berlin. In episode three, we talked about London, a world city that's been shaped by globalization and continues to affect places far beyond it. In this episode, titled Cities for the Many, Not the Few, we'll look at three other cities, Berlin, Kochi, and Istanbul. And we'll continue to ask, who are cities for? How are they governed? What makes a good city? I've been thinking and writing about cities for a long time, and I've been very lucky to meet amazing scholars, activists, and artists along the way. Their work inspires and challenges how I understand cities and how I experience them. One of those people is Dr. Anna Richter, this episode's co-host. Anna studied sociology and English literature, taught at Hafen City University in Hamburg, and is now an independent editor and translator. She's one of the editors of the academic journal City, to which Doreen Massey also contributed. Hello, Anna. Thanks for joining me. Hi. As we heard in the previous episode, Doreen Massey was a lifelong fan of Liverpool Football Club. You also have an important connection to Liverpool, right? Yes, actually, I also have a passion for Liverpool FC, but my interest in that city goes beyond football. In 2008, Liverpool was the European capital of culture, a prestigious title awarded to two cities in Europe every year. Many cities want this distinction because it comes with serious investments and international attention. Liverpool promoted urban regeneration projects So I went there to conduct research on the politics of regeneration through culture. I found that this benefited some people in the city, but definitely not the many. And Liverpool is hardly an exception. In the late 20th century, city governments across the world eagerly promoted spectacular developments. This is what geographer David Harvey calls urban entrepreneurialism. Cities adopt a corporate logic and act like businesses. They compete with each other for investments, tourists, and media attention. Massey was outspoken in her criticism of such bombastic urban projects. Here's what she said in 2006 about London's bid to host the Olympic Games in 2012. I was not in favor of the Olympic bid. Um, No. In part because the Olympics has become such a kind of marketing vehicle for a small number of major corporations. So the whole business from what the Olympics are to, is that the only way we can regenerate the Lee Valley in the East End? No, of course it's not. There are other ways of doing that, which are much more bottom-up, which are much more street level, which are much more uh, community-based. And that was what I think in the 80s, not just in London, but in lots of cities, the old municipal left, as we used to call it, that's what we were trying to do. That was the In a sense, when the social democratic consensus broke down in this country between the 60s, 70s, 80s, there were different ways out of it. There was Thatcherism and neoliberalism and the far right. And there was a breakout to the left. And some of the municipal socialism of that period was trying to think about what that might be. Mm. The Labour Party, of course, was terrified by any idea like that. It found itself in this vacuum called the third way, refused to stand up for the other alternative and Thatcherism won out. And here we are. That that is how I would see that trajectory. It's the bread and circuses logic that Massey critically addresses. She elaborated that critique in a pamphlet called Cities for the Many, Not the Few, which she wrote with geographers Ash Amin and Nigel Thrift. European capitals of culture, Olympic Games, fancy waterfronts and flashy housing estates claim to produce exactly that. Cities for the many, not the few. But if you look below this glossy surface or just around the corner, it's clear that this kind of urban development excludes most people. We reached out to one of the co-authors of the pamphlet, Ash Amin. He's a geographer at the University of Cambridge, and he's actually the reason you and I know each other, Anna. 
Right. We first met at a lecture he gave at Berlin's Humboldt University back in 2012. Oh my God, I can't believe it's been over a decade. I know. The pamphlet, Cities for the Many, Not the Few, was a response to a policy report published by the UK Urban Task Force in 1999. The report was, it was actually quite dazzling in many ways, led by a very iconic, famous architect. And, and he was also typically and understandably quite design-led. But it struck us as a group and the three of us who drafted this, this report as quite romantic in its approach and a bit elitist in the sense that it, although it made allusions to the need for cities to be reoriented, restructured uh, for the people who live in them, I think much of that responsibility of regenerating the city, they saw that it should lie in the hands of people who were in the planning and design and architectural industry. And so what we wanted to do was to look at the city as it really exists, as a space of fragments, exclusions, constant returns to those who hold power or those whose voice is the loudest. And we proposed an urbanism which would tackle these issues of the city on, on the ground itself through a politics of social empowerment, of creating conducive environments for the ordinary resident, and above all, a city that is governed in fair, inclusive and democratic ways. So what we did, I think, in this pamphlet was to put the political city before the city of new design. Masi's commitment to political thinking manifested not only in her activism, but also in her academic work. One important concept she developed is a bit of a tongue twister, thrown togetherness. Not a word you'll find in any dictionary. Let's hear from Ash what it means. Thrown togetherness is what makes contemporary urban life in all of its aspects. Things coming together from near and afar and life itself in the city produced as a result of this thrown togetherness. So relationality be becomes the vector through which public life and private life in the city emerges. And this relationality is the product of things, materials, people, cultures in one place coming together, juxtaposed together. Juxtaposition was a very important metaphor for Doreen. But what we shouldn't rush to conclude is that thrown togetherness is like a free-for-all, a republic of pluralism in which all manner of possibilities may emerge. There's a tendency sometimes to think of thrown togetherness as a, as a positive force, working for the many and not the few. And I think that's a mistaken reading of thrown togetherness. It certainly is a mistaken reading of Doreen Massey, because thrown togetherness is also very much about particular forces of power and control actively at work, ranging from those of political economy, that is the power of the state and of markets and how they structure the city, but also the forces of, let's call them, biopolitics, that is um, a machinery of judgment of the value of particular subjects, people of color as opposed to majorities or migrants as opposed to men, which these kind of forces of political economy and biopolitics are, are always at work directing thrown togetherness towards particular outcomes. And normally those outcomes privilege the few and not the many. Development projects, even those with apparently good intentions, frequently lead to entire communities losing their habitat and being displaced. We contacted someone who's been working on these issues for years, Dr. Carmel Christi KJ, an urban scholar at the University of Delhi. We met with Carmel over Zoom to discuss the effects of modernization projects in Kochi, in the Indian state of Kerala. As a port city, 
Kochi has gone through a lot of transformations along its seashores in which many communities, especially shore communities, have been displaced for development. For instance, the major developments along the seashores in Kochi such as Cochin Portress Limited, Cochin Shipyard Limited and more recently International Transshipment Terminal. All these enterprises came into place after displacing large numbers of shore communities from the shores. And as per the Indian laws, since the compensation and rehabilitation of displaced communities is not clearly enunciated, many of them are still not fully rehabilitated. And there are many protests and struggles which are still happening, asking for rehabilitation and compensation for the land from which they were evicted. And many of them also kind of put forward the statement that a land that you leave behind is not just a piece of land, but it's also a way of life that you have cultivated, your livelihood, your life itself. So how do you compensate for that land is also another big question. Carmel's focus on the intricate meanings and value of land resonates with Massey's insistence that geography matters. Massey resisted generalizations and asserted that all social processes are time and place specific. I think this also has to do with the geographical location uh, of the islands in the city. They are almost like an addendum to the city, but at the same time, islands are a crucial geographical formation which gave birth to the natural port of Cochin in its current location. And in the post-independent development narratives, the islands were not the focus of many you know, development projects or, or the islands were not fully developed on par with the Kochi metropolitan area. So one thing these protesters clarified was that it is not that we do not need development. We do need development, we do need electricity, we do need dams. But what we are talking about is sustainable development. We do not need big dams. We need to think about sustainable dams, which are probably more uh, environment friendly, which are more community friendly. There needs to be development which considers different sections in society. It shouldn't be just for one section of the society to thrive. So it's very important to bring in the question of social justice in the paradigm of development and environment. And therefore, it should also be a space where uh, all kinds of people can organize themselves, they can express their opinions, they can also dissent if uh, the city is not offering them what they rightfully need. So the city should be open and uh, it should be open enough to democratize itself again and again. It should also be a space where everybody can contribute to uh, the creation of uh, the cultural, economic or material space of the city and they should also be able to uh, enjoy the benefits of what they create or what others create as part of urban space making. How do we create such spaces? Open, inclusive, enjoyable? Who takes charge? How do we agree on what's best for our cities? As Carmel says, we need carefully designed infrastructure that makes cities livable for all. And design is also a hugely political issue, says Ashamin. Design in the hands of appropriate political leaders and planners has the sweeping ability, I think to construct cities of the future according to a particular blueprint of the good life. But therein lies some of the problems as well, you know, um, which have to do with the uh, pretense of being able top-down to engineer life prospects and well-being prospects for everybody. Design comes with its own violence, of excluding some people and not others, some environments and not others, forcing a kind of pathway to prosperity that people on the ground may not actually approve of, and create structures in the city which might be infrastructures or buildings or environments which are in some ways quite oppressive, you know, modernist planning, created structures which were well-intentioned because they were supposed to 
make the life prospects of the poor much, much better by providing decent housing, um, breathable air, little gardens sometimes in the garden city movement. But with these uh, attempts to engineer the future, I think came an awful lot of uh, difficulties of cramped space, of enforced forms of living, and so on and so forth. And it's not just infrastructure design that can produce enforced forms of living. The political design of housing projects can be harmful too, even when they're promoted as social improvements. To better understand such dynamics, we spoke to Dr. Ayte Chafta, who has been analyzing housing developments in Istanbul for many years. Aisha is an anthropologist and journalist, and she's currently my colleague at Bard College Berlin. We met with Aisha in Berlin's Gleisdreieck Park on a very hot summer day, right before an epic storm. Turkey, where Aisha is from, has been experiencing a housing boom for a couple of decades now. Here's how it started. Since the beginning, Erdogan, Tayyip Erdogan and his Justice and Development Party, the AKP, have promoted the construction sector as a dynamo of the national economy. This approach was strictly in line with the classical promise of populism, of course. Investing in the construction sector, they aim to give everyone a dream of owning proper house. Plus, they wanted to create the impression that unemployment is decreasing in especially big cities thanks to the construction industry. Finally, they also created an illusion of prosperity by boosting consumption. The slums, I mean Gecekondu neighborhoods in Turkish, we call them Gecekondu neighborhoods, uh, and other poor historical areas in the big cities, especially in Istanbul, were the first and most affected by the urban transformation policy of the AKP. First of all, most of the unemployed people were living in the slums in Gecekondu neighborhoods. They were complaining of the uncertainty regarding the property status of their houses and the lack of infrastructure when it comes to especially Gecekondu neighborhoods because they are informal neighborhoods. That's why their property status was not uh, determined, was not clear. And also, they were looking for the Gecekondu dwellers, looking for opportunities to jump uh, to the upper classes. So the urban transformation and destruction of Gecekondu neighborhoods, paradoxically, emerged as the original promise of Erdogan to his lower class supporters. I should say it was like Erdogan came to power promising, I will destroy your neighborhoods and your houses. The Housing Development Administration essentially forces people into poverty. It steals people's housing and communities and sells them lifelong mortgages. Working classes became even more vulnerable to economic and political crisis because they are now in debt to the banks for very, very long terms. On the other hand, it is unclear if the new houses in the gated communities built by uh, housing administration are better than Gecekondu's. Regarding their quality, there are many problems. What is important is that their property status is even more unstable than Gecekondu's as they depend on long-term loans. I mean, if a family cannot pay their installments for three months, they might lose their houses and also savings. So this is the biggest crisis. The AKP uses this risk as an advantage in every election. Um, they have taken everyone living in the one million houses built in urban transformation project in the last 18 years as their electoral hostages. However, this advantage doesn't work anymore, it seems, as we saw in the last local elections in uh, 2019, the AKP lost both Ankara and Istanbul. These are the cities subjected to destructive urban transformation more than any city in Turkey. Aisha sees a glimpse of hope in electoral politics. AKP's loss in Turkey's major cities is an important signal for sure, but that's not where the struggle for a more equal city ends. Power left to its own devices whether it is at the state level or at the urban level, will make the city in its own image and for the interests 
of those who wish to advance. So it then follows, I think, that the only way to change things is to make sure that you have organized power from below, that communities and neighborhoods and those who feel disaffected and alienated come together to make their voices be heard, to demand that their interests are represented, and to put continuous pressure on those who hold power to give way. We're recording this episode in Berlin, where a year ago we had a successful referendum on the expropriation of corporate landlords. That is, Berlin voted to take back properties from real estate companies that own more than 3,000 housing units. That gives them too much control over the city's rental prices. 59% of the votes supported plans to take back these large housing stocks and turn them into affordable public housing. The referendum was a serious step towards social justice in the housing market. For months before the vote, the city was covered in campaign stickers, posters and banners in multiple languages, speaking to Berlin's residents in their native tongues. Yes, it was amazing. I remember the first time I saw a poster that addressed me in Polish. Aby Berlin pozostał naszym domem. So that Berlin remains our home. I was deeply moved. I felt that finally someone acknowledged something I'd known to be true for a long time. That Berlin is my home. But only German citizens registered in Berlin were eligible to vote. Many migrants were unable to vote on this crucial issue affecting their homes. Clearly, the legal structure doesn't correspond to our lived reality. The referendum reflects a collective voice, loud and clear. It's a voice that rejects speculative, commodified and financialized housing models and opposes displacement and exclusion. Berliners have openly called for social alternatives that support affordable housing. But one year later, the city government has done nothing to cater to the majority of voters and supporters. The referendum has had no real effect yet, but the campaign can still be considered successful because it sparked countless public debates and private conversations about what kind of city we want to live in. Everyone seemed to be talking about it, at school, at home, at work, on public transport and bars. I remember one day my kid came back from school with an assignment to design a city of the future. I asked him to first consider the ideas behind the design. So I asked, what makes a good city? Here's how he responded. Good food for everyone, no racism, no sexism, everyone has the same rights. We asked our guests to respond to this question too. For me, a good city is one that organizes for the commons. And that means shared interests. It means ensuring common spaces. It absolutely means some form of public ownership and audit. Above all, it means accepting that the city does not belong to special interests, whether those are native interests or majority interests or the interests of humans alone. You know, our cities are full of non-human life and a good city should be that city that finds a way of accepting, understanding, incorporating these diverse needs and interests in the city. And the only way you can do that, at least I think philosophically, is to accept that the city um, in its thrown togetherness is a commons. A good city is an urban space where sustainable development is practiced so that progress is ensured for all, not just for few. And therefore, the true meaning of environmental justice prevails. For me, it is very obvious, equality. <laughs> the, the will to create an equalitarian society among citizens could make any city good. I mean, an equalitarian will from below. I'm not talking about kind of equality provided by the states, by the laws and so on, but an equalitarian, a civic 
equalitarian will coming from below. It could start with demanding equality before law and institutions, but it is not the end. It's just starting point. What makes a good city are also good places. One such good place for me is Gleisdreieck Park, where we met with Aisha. It's an old train junction turned into a green area with private housing developments on its fringes. The park has become a popular leisure location for Berliners and visitors. That's where people come to ride their skateboards, play frisbee, enjoy picnics, exercise or just air their minds. We came here to ask people what they think makes a good city. What makes a good city? What makes a good city? Of course, a city where all the basic needs of the residents are met, like uh, housing and food and warmth, shelter, education. Of course, the question is what are basic needs, but at least these and some more. And I guess in a city where the demand is very high, that many people want to live, that it's very important to really um, like give enough housing and maybe housing for free for everyone or some other way to to pay for it. Also eine gute Stadt äh, besteht meistens aus den guten Menschen und äh, das Miteinander ist immer entscheidend, finde ich. Ähm, man sollte sich wohlfühlen in seiner Stadt und äh, eine gute Nachbarschaft ist natürlich auch wichtig in einer guten Stadt. Und äh, gerade wenn so viele so multikulturelle Städte wie Berlin, dass die Leute sich auch wirklich äh, nicht parallel leben, sondern wirklich miteinander. Genau, das ist mein Statement dazu. And now in English. A good city is made up of good people and their togetherness is always a deciding factor. You should feel good in your city. Being good neighbors is also important and especially in a multicultural city like Berlin, people should not live in silos but truly together. So I'm from Collective Political Kitchen and for us it's very important like two topics, social justice and food justice. Solidarity is one of the of the main activity for us, so we organize a lot of um, events, uh, for example, like Solidarity Kitchen, when we cook and um, eat together in the neighborhood. And the second topic, of course, it's uh, discrimination, that um, we need more spaces uh, that can protect us like from from discrimination because me and um, all members of our collective we have a migration background and um, so we try to uh, to make our work uh, more like to fight this uh, discrimination structures also access to resources access to funds access to different um, opportunities, access to good food, healthy food, cheap food, uh, ethical food, local food. <laughs> um, maybe not, um, you know, access to all types of food all year long. That's maybe not so necessary. That's too much of a luxury maybe, so just seasonal food. Eine gute Stadt macht für mich aus, wenn sie aus einer nicht weißen, alten, cis-männlichen Perspektive gedacht wird, sondern aus einer diskriminierungssensiblen, einer feministischen Perspektive. Das ist, glaube ich, der eine Punkt. Und der zweite Punkt ist, dass äh, die Staatsstruktur nicht aus einer autofreundlichen Perspektive gedacht wird, sondern tatsächlich aus Fußgänger einen kinderfreundlichen oder äh, eher mobilitätsfreundlichen für Menschen, die kein Auto fahren, Perspektive gedacht wird. And now in English. A good city for me is created from a perspective that is not white, old, cis male dominant, but instead from a feminist perspective that's sensitive to various forms of discrimination. That's one thing. And another is that the urban structure shouldn't be designed for cars, but for pedestrians, children, bikes, wheelchairs, for people who don't drive cars. I think what's uh, good for the cities, um the government should make uh, the city more green, yeah? And then more uh, trash bin, so the people can throw the, the garbage, not everywhere, yeah, I think only that. What makes a good city? Um, like many parks, uh, many stores, um, and 
may, uh, maybe um, some zoos for the animals and yes and good schools and good like a good infrastructure yes what makes a great city is when its inhabitants can enjoy all of the amazing things that go on in the city, whether it's culturally, whether it's like for your health, biking, parks, um, all of that, I think that's what makes a great city. And I love the fact that uh, this particular city um, inspires all of that. It inspires you to go out to explore, to, to connect, and, uh, and the people as well. And uh, that's also what makes in this episode, we discussed various dimensions of urban politics. For Doreen Massey, every place, every city, poses a challenge. The challenge of negotiating a here and now, or what she called thrown togetherness. We heard about different struggles to make cities more livable, and more just, for the many. We also discussed the many limitations of the dominant political structures. The examples shared by Aisha, Carmel, and Ash show that it is crucial to make our voices heard and to put continuous pressure on those who hold power to give way. We'd love to hear from you, our listeners, what you think makes a good city. Please take a moment to fill out the form linked in the episode notes to respond to this question. To learn more about the things we discussed today, visit the podcast page at thesociologicalreview.org. That's where you'll find a reading list. Today's episode was created by Susan Stone. Reese Cox, Adele Martin, Bose Sarmiento, and me, Agata Lisiak. Spatial Delight is funded by the Volkswagen Foundation and hosted by the Sociological Review Foundation. Big thanks to today's guests, Ash Amin, Carmel Christie, Aisha Chavdar, the Berliners we met in the park, and to my wonderful co-host, Anna Richter. Thank you for listening.